Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna alhamdulillahi nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'firuhu wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyati amalina man yahdihi allahu falamudilla lah wa man yudlil falahadiya lah wa ashadu an la ilaha illa allahu wa ahtahu la sharika lah wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh ya ayuhal ladhina amanu attaqu allaha haqqa tuqatihi wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun ya ayuhal nasu attaqu rabbakum aladhi khalakakum min nafsin wahida وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارحام ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما ما بعد فان صدق الحديث كتاب الله واحسن الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار uh, first of all as usual uh, thank you very much for granting me this opportunity to be uh, present be- before you speaking about uh, one of the most important uh, topic that we have to be discussing in this uh, contemporary era i do believe in that because we are living in a time which you have a clear disconnection of uh, the present from the past and that's why wallahu a'lam we get lost we are thinking that we're making progress but we're getting lost uh, as i always mention in this member and some other manabir that uh, allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed that this ummah of muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam is going to be the last and the final nation created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before the day of judgment Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said antum mufuna sab'ina ummatan min al-umam antum khayruha wa akramuha ala Allah he said you are the completion of 70 nations 70 nations we the complete completion of the 70 nations and Allah created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala He says we are the best and the most honored by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what is the point of you being the last? What is the point of you being the last? There is no significance except the fa- the, the fact that you are supposed to be making analogy. Analogy means qiyas. Look at the past, those who came before you to see the nature of their life, what exactly happened and what was the conclusion of their life? it is going to be one of the two things one of the two ends either they succeed or they fail in life either they succeeded or they fail and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for wisdom he did not hide anything he has granted us the fact of the history of those nations in detail much more greater than what we're looking for and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't speak like human beings and doesn't speak like the creation when he talks about the history he focus on the essence and the main objectives we have somebody singing with us here okay anyway let's uh, me utilize uh, the time so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always focus on the most important part of the history and the objectives what are you supposed to be benefiting from a history mentioned by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala these are the focus For those of you who are reading Quran constantly you know I'm telling you the truth you can find a story of a prophet being mentioned by Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala in two three lines you know two three lines Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala would talk about the prophet because he just goes straight to the point and mention the most important part of the life of this prophet and the people and what Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala concluded with for example read surah al-shu'ara when Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the people of nuh he says what kazzabat qawm kazzabat qawm nuh al mursalin if qala lahum akhuhum nuh ala tattaqun inni lakum rasulun amin the whole history of nuh alayhi salam and you know he took 950 years giving da'wah to those people you know from the time he started giving da'wah until the time allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed those people he spent 950 years but the whole thing allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put it in less than a page you know if you read you find a bit of mention about nuh alayhi salam focusing on the most important part of the life of that person because when you 
Cutting yourself so much, you talk about so many things which are not significant, you are going to remove the significance and the most important thing that you are trying to send to the audience. That's why I really recommend that when you want to take a lesson, take it from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in this surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after every mention of a prophet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, Inna fi dhalika la ayah, wa ma kana aktharuhum mu'mineen, wa inna rabbaka lahu al-azizul rahim. In that which has been mentioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there are great signs, things to be reflect, reflecting upon, you know, to ponder upon them and to reflect, to understand how to live in this life. But unfortunately, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, unfortunately, the vast majority of the people are heedless. Not many people read the history in this regard. We laugh, we enjoy. But the main lesson which is intended by mentioning that history is not taken by the audience. So that's the reason why I said it is a great honor to be part of the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and it's also a great honor and a blessing from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to be the last nation because we can read about the past and study their life and get exactly what they did. If those people are led to the success, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala mentioned to us the root of that success so we can just have I mean, we can just apply them and then we can reach the same conclusion. That's why we need to link ourselves to the past. Allah SWT sent around 124,000 prophets and messengers. The best one is Muhammad SAW. And he has chosen for the Prophet SAW people to support him and help him until he conveyed the message. These are the ones that we call companions of Rasulullah SAW. They're the best ever created after the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You will never see somebody better than the companions of Rasulullah. Afdalu sahabi rasulin, they are the ashabu nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. According to the aqeedah of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. And these companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they are not equal in terms of their nature. They are not equal in terms of their contribution and participation to the da'wah. They are not equal. A difference. Even in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they are not equal. Some of them are better than the other. They used to say that we used to say Abu Bakr is the best in front of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam and he keeps quiet. And we used to say after Abu Bakr is Umar and he keeps quiet. So this shows that these people are the best and they are not equal in terms of nature. So today inshallah we're going to pick up from those companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam to speak about one of them which I believe the world needs to know about him. But unfortunately, the story of Umar has been mentioned by many. And even in this member also we talk about it, but I guess people used to forget. So I will summarize the most important part of the life of Umar radiallahu anhu. When I was given the topic, I was trying to recall that information that I had long ago and I also presented. I get confused. Because subhanAllah, every part of the history of Umar radiallahu anhu, you can have lectures on that part of the history. So if we're going to talk about Umar radiallahu anhu from A to Z, then we need the whole year actually, every day, without exaggeration. Without exaggeration. If you want to know how much this person weighs, not only to the Muslims, even to the non-Muslim also, he's the man, you know. That person who tried to extract from the humankind the hundred mo most influential people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ever created. Umar amongst the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to my knowledge, is the only one. He put him as number 50. Never mind, we take it like that. Although we believe it's wrong, but we accept. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the only correct thing he mentioned is when he put Rasulullah in number one. And he was a Christian. But he says, since we are talking about honesty in research, we have to present the one that qualifies our conditions. That's why, that's why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa became the first one. And he had number 50, Umar radiallahu anhu. And he has Isa alayhi salam around number 5 or 4. He did not even put him number 2. We believe that arrangement is wrong. Because according to our aqeedah and the aqeedah of the correct religion of Isa alayhi salam, which is also Islam, that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa should be the first, you know, followed by Ibrahim alayhi salam. So he was right in this. The second person should be Ibrahim alayhi salam. 
The third person should be Musa alayhi salam. The fourth one should be Isa alayhi salam. And the fifth one should be Nuh alayhi salam. And then Abu Bakr should be the next. Not Umar radiallahu anhu. Abu Bakr should be the next. And then Umar radiallahu anhu. And then Uthman radiallahu anhu. And then Ali radiallahu anhu. And then Al Hassan radiallahu anhu. And then you go Muawiyah. And then you go to the rest of the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam according to the way the Nusus suggest. We can confirm about those four. Their ranking is according to that which I had mentioned. But other than that, we say what? Allahu alam. So this Umar radiallahu anhu is the man that we really need, really need to know who he was. So my lecture, inshallah, today is not going to focus on the way Umar looks like. I might not talk about that at all. You go get it from Sheikh Google and the other scholars there, inshallah, is more than, more than enough. But I will be trying to take lessons from his life. You get an idea? Every stage that I'm going to be discussing, ta'ala, my focus will be on the main lessons we can extract from that. So I will begin from his life before Islam. Who was he? And I will be very brief because the time that has been given to me is about an hour and and the half. One hour, 30 minutes. Okay. We will negotiate, inshallah. What was his name? His name is Umar ibn al-Khattab. Okay, I will mention that which the historian mentioned. You know, the most important thing is, remember the first one. Umar ibn al-Khattab. But they said his nasab, his lineage, could be traced back to the lineage of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He met with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in some of his grandparents. So he's Umar. Ibn al-Khattab, Ibn al-Nufayl, Ibn Abdul Uzza, Ibn al-Rayah, Ibn Abdullah, Ibn al-Qurab, Ibn al-Razah, Ibn al-Adi, Ibn al-Kaab, Ibn al-Lu'ay, Ibn al-Ghalib, al-Qurashi, al-Adawi. Which one you remember? None. So that's why I said just, just remember the, the first one. Umar Ibn al-Khattab. His name and the name of, of his father. These are the most important ones, inshallah. His kunya is Abu Hafs and his title is al farooq Nickname given to him, or the title given to Umar radiallahu anhu, the laqab, is al faru They mentioned, wallahu alam, that the reason why he was called al faru is because of the impact he had on the Muslim and Islam also itself, right after he converted to Islam, and also when he migrated to Medina to meet Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi or to receive Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in that place. We will talk about this inshallah, then you will understand why people used to call him al faru Farraqa bayn al-Haqqi wal batil He was born during the year of Fil, the year of the elephant. You know, they mentioned that the Arabs, they used to recognize their age, okay, and the, they used to use event to recognize their age and the time. This thing happens during this, this thing happened during this. That's why they will tell you Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was born during the year of the feed. When is the year of the feed? This is the time when Abraha comes to, to take over the Kaaba, right? And what happened to him? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed him with what? What did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do when he? He sent him Tayr al-Ababid, right? Is it, is it a bird? Okay, sorry to my question. I'm going to make a conclusion. You will understand why am I asking you these simple questions. Tayrul Ababil, is it a bird that comes and kills those people? No. What is that? Huh? Oh, the clays comes by themselves and then they kill the, the... No, I just want to know because it might be some new knowledge to me. The clay comes or the birds... Ah, the birds bring the clay, right? So, I have a sword. Okay, I don't have one. But let's say I have, you know, then go and say to FBI, I have. I have a sword and I hit somebody with it. Who killed the person? The sword, right? <laughs> well, you know, all the criminals will be happy with you to be in the court, you know? <laughs> it will tell you, I did not do this. The, and subhanAllah, you know we have some people who will talk about this thing. They will say that this is what is called a tawallud. Tawallud means the consequence of an act. 
They said it shouldn't be attributed to you. It is attributed to that thing because you take the sword and hit. But the result happens not because of you. The sword did it. Do you get that? So if we take this concept, then khalas, no crime could be recognized as crime, right? Everyone can do everything, and he will say, Wallah, I didn't do the sword did. I just hit him with it, right? We also apply the same thing. We hit him back. We tell the sword also did. Anyway, so back to the thing. So who killed the... The birds brought the things, right? Allah SWT says we sent to them Tarul Ababil. Okay, why do I ask you this question? Because we are living in a time whereby people believe that Quran has a batil. Uh, not batil, batil. But it's also batil, you know. It has a batil. Batil means hidden meaning which is not understood by the masses. And this is contrary to that which Allah SWT mentioned when he says, we send down Quran bidi salin arabi in movie. If you say that everything Allah SWT said is, has a hidden meaning, then that means Quran is not bilisan in Arabi in Mubinda. It would be very complicated because every single thing, you, the way you see it, it is not like that. You have to go to somebody and ask him for interpretation. And the question, the Arabs during the time of Rasulullah do they always go to Rasulullah and ask him about every single ayah that he recited to them? No. Only a few moments you see them asking Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Only a few moments you see Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam granting them the tafsir of the Quran. Why is that? Because they are the expert of the language. When it comes to the ibadah, those rituals, they need somebody to clarify that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants. So explanation has to be given from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But when it comes to understanding life in the way it is, you know, facts of history. Why do I need to go to somebody if the language used in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is known to me? But nowadays, subhanAllah, we're living in a time which everything is almost twisted upside down. You talk about Quran, they will tell you that it's hidden meaning. You know? This I in particular, some people said, actually, there was no bird which comes, you know. This is just a metaphor, you know. But there was no bird. Allah says bird, they said, no, it wasn't a bird. It was a plague and a calamity that Allah SWT sent to those people. They died because of it. It was a disease. SubhanAllah. Allah says, bird, they tell you something else. So that's the reason why I was, I was asking you about it. I know, you know, but I just want you to have a clear stance that Quran comes in Arabic language and every Muslim is supposed to understand the source of the Quran through what? Through the literal meaning. We don't go for interpretation unless if it is not clear or we have evidence that this literal meaning is not intended. You get it? So please do understand this. So when Allah says this and then somebody tells you, no, there is another hidden meaning, tell him which language Allah SWT is using. He has to provide an evidence for that. Otherwise, he will be, he will be wrong in his, in his approach. So Rasulullah was born in the year of the field, right? Umar radiallahu anhu was born after that event, 11 and 13 years after that event. That means Rasulullah is older than him, around 12 to 13 years. Okay? And they become the best friends. Because friendship is supposed to be based on quality. Wallahi, a smart person can take somebody who is way younger than him in terms of age because of the quality they have. That's why Umar radiallahu anhu used to carry Abdullah ibn Abbas. And at that time, Abdullah ibn Abbas was very young. And he used to go to, to, to the majlis, which he used to sit with the people of Badr. You know, people of Badr, they're like the, the, the senators here. You know. Senators in our own time, you know, these are the people who are the law makers, you know, policy makers. You know. In the time of Umar radiallahu anhu, you have those great people who participated in the Battle of Badr, and the main battles with Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Whenever an issue happens, he used to gather them and come and discuss with them to make a proper conclusion. He used to take Abdullah ibn, Mas Abdullah ibn Abbas with him to the place, and they neglected their children. And why did he take him to the place? It wasn't because he is connected to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, but there are other people who are also connected to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. It was because of the quality he has, which you might not find it with others. That's why he neglected his own children which, who are older than Abdullah ibn Abbas. But he wanted to teach them a lesson that friendship and closeness to somebody should be based on what? Based on quality. And my brothers and sisters, 
this is one of the key to the, the reason why those people succeeded in the past. Everything is all about religion. Religion is the first. I recall Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, when his daughter complained to him about how much she suffered from, from who? Who was the husband? Because you asked me which daughter first. Okay, Asma bint Abi Bakr, she's older than Aisha radiallahu anha, 10 years older than Aisha. She was married to who? As Zubair bin Awam. Okay? One of the 10 companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who were granted paradise. Okay? She was married to that person. And this one, they said, it is part of his nature that when he gets angry, subhanAllah. They even mentioned that Umar once told him, he said, Ara law alat ilik. He says, I think a person like you, if you are to be the Khalifa, you can wage war because of one hand of rice that is missing in the community. You know, you, you have to weigh the benefits. And so they used to attribute to him the statement that says, "Ana mu'min rida wa kafirul ghadab." He used to say that when I'm angry, when I'm angry, my anger is is kafir. Kafir doesn't mean kufur. Kufur means it's blind. You know. So it's very harsh, you know. He used to smack his wife when, when they do something. So, so Asma bint Abi Bakr, she married him. She's a new person to the family. She doesn't know who he was. So whenever she did something wrong, he will slap her. He will smack her. So she used to get into trouble working in the farm and then coming back when she did something simple, the man will, cannot control himself, he will get her. She complained to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. I'm not saying take this example. This is a wrong example. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa has said to those people who are beating their wives, he says, those ones are not the best amongst you. Let those enemies of Islam who are criticizing Islam for this concept that exists in Surah Al-Nisa, when Allah SWT says, do the mawida, do this, do that, and then if it is not possible, then you beat. And then people criticize Islam for this, which the same or worse than that exists in their religion also. Let them understand the principle and the concept and what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said about that. He said, these are not the khiyar amongst you. And as one of our scholars mentioned that if you reach the moment that you raise up your hand and hit your wife, definitely you fail in your relationship with your family members. Because if you are a successful person in terms of terbiya approach, you will never reach to that conclusion. Allah SWT granted him a lot of means for you to attain success in a family life instead of reaching this conclusion. So, Zubair ibn Awam was like that. So when the wife complained to her father, Abu Bakr, what do you think was the advice given by him to her? He says, daughter, please exercise patience. He said, exercise patience. Why did he ask her? He, he did not condone what was done. But he says, please exercise more patience. Why? He says, For inni samiratu nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ayakul inna zubair rajulun salih. He said, because I have heard Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying, Zubair is one of the righteous people. He wants the company. Okay? He wants the company, that's why he asked her to exercise more patience. And the same goes to anything in Islam, you can see the focus is based on, based on religion. So he was born uh, 13 years after the Amal Fid and his grandfather, who was the grandfather? We said Umar ibn al-Khattab. Sorry, I was the one who told you don't remember the rest, right? And now I'm asking you who was the grandfather. The grandfather is Nufail ibn Abdul Uzza, right? He's what, he used to be one of the most influential personalities in in Mecca, the Quraysh used to report their cases and seek a consultation from, from him. So he's from a noble family. Right. His mother, her name was Hantama bint Hashim, uh, bint al -Mugira. Some scholars uh, said she was the sister of Abu Jahl. And I guess Abu Jahl is known to everyone. And some of them said she was a cousin to Abu Jahl. Whatever the case might be, she is related to that family of, of Abu Jahl. Okay, Umar married, not like you guys, he married, and he married seven wives. 
حلال وحرام Which religion is that? <laughs> so he married seven wives. Okay, I'm not going to talk about this issue. Uh, go to your scholar and ask your wife whether it is okay or not. But anyway, uh, he married seven wives, but not all together at once. Collectively, uh, the, the wives he stayed with in the Jahili period and Islam, if you look at them collectively, he married seven. He married, divorced. Some of them died. Some of them he divorced. He divorced them, but they reached up to seven. And uh, the most important thing that I want to stress on in this regard, you know, Umar married. As I said, not like you, waiting to finish your professorship, and then you can go ahead, inshallah. I wish you all the best. So, Umar married, and you know what he says? He says, ma aati nisa lishahwa, walawla walad ma baalaytu an ara imratan bi'aini. Subhanallah. You can see the focus of the marriage and you can understand why those generations are the most successful one in terms of family life. He said, I never come across, uh, I never come across a woman approach my wife in terms of sexual relationship just because of a personal desire. I have a bigger intention behind that. He says, Lawl al walad, if not because of the awlad, children, he says, I don't want to see an opposite gender in my life. I don't care. Even if I don't see anyone in my life amongst the opposite gender, I don't care. But I like the idea because of the child. And he mentioned, why does, why does he wonder? He said, Inni la nafsi. He said, sometimes I force myself ala al-jima raja'a an yukhrij allahu minni nasamatan tusabbihuhu wa tadkuruhu. SubhanAllah. He says, sometimes I force myself to have relationship with my, my wife, not because I want it, and not because I need it, but I just have a hope that maybe Allah SWT would extract from this relationship somebody who will be worshiping Allah SWT in the future. That means the basis of life in the house of Umar was what? Religion, from day one. And my brothers and sisters, this is what Rasulullah advised you from the beginning. Nowadays in some places, the percentage of the divorce is greater than the marriage itself. In every place you go, this is an epidemic nowadays. Divorce, is it halal or haram? Okay, it's halal. Although that is a hadith that is batil which says it is the most hated halal to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's wrong hadith. Because you might have a divorce that is wajib for you to divorce. Okay, that is the divorce which will be mustahab. Patience cannot be tolerated at a moment then to be separated is better for both of them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when kulla min sa'ati. That's why you find the companions of the Prophet sallallahu almost each and every one of them divorce. Because what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah, he says, فَإِمْسَاكُمْ بِمَعْرُوفٍ أَوْ تَسْلِحٌ بِإِحْسَانٍ That is the way to live with the wife, with the spouse. If you know you cannot live with them in that way, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, تَسْلِحٌ بِالْإِحْسَانٍ let you guys get separated and when he tafarraqa yughni Allahu kulla min sa'ati if you guys are separated Allah SWT is going to grant each and every one of you from his blessings and subhanallah as long as both are doing the right thing at the end of the day even if the separation happens Allah SWT will be with each and every one of them so i will summarize the needed requirement in this regard looking at the vast majority of you guys are Single. That's how you call the one who did not marry yet, right? What should be the focus when you decide to marry? What should be the focus? Religion and manners. These are the advice of Rasulullah He says, People usually marry a woman. And this should be the way you interpret this hadith. Don't you ever say a woman should be married because of one of the four things. This is strong interpretation, even according to the language itself. Interpret the hadith means people usually marry because of one of the four things. Wealth, positions, lineage, and beauty. And Rasulullah says, عَلَيْكَ بِذَاتِ الدِّينِ تَرِبَتِ Usually people go, especially when it comes to, that, to the last one. 
how beautiful or ha how handsome is a person, we go with that. And agree or not to agree. You will agree later if you don't agree now that this physical appearance that you see being placed by Allah SWT in each and every one of us has a time to fizzle, to fade. If you want to testify my, my words to confirm that it is correct, go and look at your old pictures if you have one when you are young. How was it? If you compare this with the old one, sometimes you have to tell your mother, are you sure I'm this one? So pretty, you know, but when you look at yourself, when you age, you become somebody else. And this is who we are. I was telling a brother, right after the first child, the wife is going to change, you know, and you also change. He said, no, it's wrong. So what do you mean by that? He says, no, after a few days after the marriage, she's going to become somebody else. So I was going to argue, but then I remember something which you might disagree with. But this marriage, both of you are nothing but just like the phone you have. And the first time, so that nobody should go and say that I call the wives like the telephone or the husband like that. But anyway, I look at it like that. The first time when you bought your Samsung iPhone or whatever phone you are buying, you know, the first day when you get it, how was it? MashaAllah, very special, right? When you come back home, you tell people, please don't touch, you know. When you come to pray to Allah SWT, look at the way you put it on the ground, very slow, slowly. After a few days, you know I'm telling the truth. After a few days when you reach the masjid, how was it? You throw it like that. And your kids also do that. I iron their clothes with it and you don't care, you don't mind, right? This is how I look at the marital relationship. At the first, you're very interested. I mean, you're highly interested to see her and she's highly interested to see you. MashaAllah, they both think that this is Jannah in dunya. And then after a few days, Wallahi, some of the marriages that I come across, the marriage was gone. You know when? In a week. My sheikh told me one day that he visited somebody. He told him two, three weeks, some of them cut off the marriage. I have seen one of them in a week, the marriage was gone. And then we realized that the base of that marriage is just nothing but how to fulfill the personal desire. And the person couldn't see that much and he left. So, brothers and sisters, this is a very, very important message. Wallahi, take it seriously, it's a very important message. You will never stay like this, it will change. So you have a lot of beauties in you, okay? The beauty of the religion, the beauty of the manners, the physical parents that Allah SWT granted you. You have a lot of beauty of wealth, beauty of this and that. The scholar said the only one that remains is what? The beauty of the religion. And you know the secret behind that? If you love somebody for the sake of Allah, and by the way, brothers and sisters, do not misunderstand me. Okay? To say that I am recommending that you go and marry somebody who is ugly according to you. No, I never said that. And I would never say this. But I'm just saying that the focus of your marriage should not be that which they have. The first thing that you should put in your mind is how are they in terms of manners and religion? When they pass these two tests, then you go for the last one. The last one is the way they look like according to you. And sometimes we made a mistake, we sent our parent. In some cultures, actually the approval will not be given except if your father and your mother sign that this girl is okay, subhanAllah. We become like product or animals, you know, somebody has to go and tell whether it's okay or not. What is this? And the scholars have mentioned that this beauty and ugliness doesn't exist. It does exist in the mind of individual. That's why what you see as beauty or handsome, somebody might see it and say, Auzu billah. He will laugh. Sometimes you will say something, this is so nice. But then somebody would, would be thinking, what is he talking about? You know? Do you get an idea? So that's the reason why you don't some, send somebody. You do it yourself manually to see whether you can be comfortable or not. But my brothers and sisters, take this seriously. The first thing is the religion. And the second thing is the manner. If this test is passed by the spouse that you're looking for, the next should come, which is to see that partner that you want to be with. Are you okay with the way they look or you're not okay with the way they look? So as I said, the secret behind this is if you focus on the deen, deen will not go. And it is going to blind your eyes. The chain that is going to take place in the future, you might not recognize it because you always look at the deen that that person has. And I have two stories which I would not mention any one of them to you. 
but I will just give you the conclusion. One of them, one of the scholars was mentioning that somebody married and they asked him about his wife. He said, only religion. Let, is the, I mean, the only thing that is forcing me to keep her with me and I cannot sacrifice this woman is her religion and her good manners. In terms of the way she looks, the man made a mistake according to him. But she was a very religious person and he became a righteous person because of her. He said, Lo dunya. He said, if you give me all of the sisters on earth in order to divorce this one to get them, he says, I will never do that. And subhanAllah, miskina, what protected her? The religion. And I met a friend also who told me this. He married, he said, the only reason why he is keeping the, the spouse is the religion, and the attitude, and the manner. So do not focus on this physical appearance because it's going to go. I like you because of the way you look like. The, the moment I don't see this, I'm going to change, change my mind. So you should see that Umar, the, base, the basis of his marriage is what? How to raise up the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how to establish a family that is participating in what? The remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be part of your life, so let your life be based on this in the way the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to do. Umar used to be among those people who know how to read and write. You know, the Arabian Peninsula, not many people know how to read and write. That's why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, according to the best opinion of the scholars, that he is al-ummi. Al-ummi, according to the best interpretation of the scholars, al-ummi means somebody who doesn't know how to read and write. That's the reason why the miracle exists. Nowadays also you have some of the speakers, I can call them. Okay. I don't want to use that word in the wrong place, but they might be trying to put doubt in you that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he knows how to read and write. Okay, I don't know what they're talking about because according to the word itself and what is mentioned by, by the scholars who are least in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa it is a well-known fact that he doesn't, need, he doesn't know how to read and write. During the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, they, 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 they asked him to, to write the treaty and Ali bin Abi Talib was writing. You know, he write from Muhammad Rasulullah, you know, uh, the one who was, who was negotiating with him, he said, no, I don't agree with this. He said, because if we agree that he is Rasulullah, why do we come for negotiation? He said, we don't agree with him to be Rasulullah. You have to write from Muhammad ibn Abdullah. So when they asked him to remove Bismillah, Ali, remove it. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi told him to remove that, because he says Bismillah, they said, we don't know who is Allah. Uh, uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. They said, we know Allah, but we don't know ar-Rahman. And this is also a lie. They know ar-Rahman. They used to have it in their own poetry. Okay? But it is not that much used by them. But they know it, you know. But they deny it just to make Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sometimes a person try to provoke you to see what kind of reaction you're going to, to have. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam won the treaty to, to pass. So he told Ali bin Abi Talib, remove that. Just write Bismika, Allahumma. But when it comes to Rasulullah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was denied this right. He told Ali bin Abi Talib, remove it. Ali bin Abi Talib says, no. Allah called you Rasulullah and I remove it. He says, never. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked him, where is it? You know, he has to ask, where is it? They told him where the Rasulullah is located and he shared it. That's why when Abdullah ibn Abbas was deb debating with the Khawarij, he told them, what, what is your problem? You guys are having problem with the, Muslim, with the rest of the Muslims. What is your problem with Ali bin Abi Talib? They said, we have two main problems with him. One of them is, he defeated the enemy during the battle of Jamal, and he did not take them as slaves. He did not enslave anyone. And the second problem we have, he was called Amir al-Mu'mineen, but he says he doesn't want that. Just call me Ali bin Abi Talib. Get it? And the third problem is that he led somebody to be the judge instead of making Quran being the judge between, what, between him and Muawiyah. And subhanAllah, you know, somebody, when somebody who has knowledge speaks, he managed to convince them that these criticisms are just nothing but stupidities. When they said he, he should enslave people, they told him, okay, no problem. Amongst the army of Muawiyah radiallahu anhu, there was Aisha radiallahu anha. Imagine Aisha was a slave of one of you. Would you be happy with that? And then they started looking at each other. 
They don't know how to reply to that question. They never thought of somebody telling them this. You know? That one was gone. And he says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when it comes to the blood issues, these are Muslims who are going to meet each other. Ibn Kathir, in his book of Bida'a wa Nihaya, he says, it is mentioned in the history that almost 30,000 people lost their life during the Battle of Jamal. You know, that's too much. And these are all Muslims, you know that? And now Ali is looking for a way out. Muawiyah is looking for a way out. Talha is looking for a way out. And what to do? We should bring representative from here and representative from there. You know, this is what is not wanted by the Khawarij. And when somebody doesn't use the knowledge or doesn't use the proper channel, you will make this conclusion. So they validate the blood of a Muslim because of this. They said he rejected the hukum of Allah SWT and used the hukum of human beings. Abdullah ibn Abbas said, you know what Hajj is all about. In Hajj, if somebody kills an animal, this is an animal, right? Not human beings. How do we decide the compensation and the punishment and the penalty? Allah says you have to bring two people among the scholars or the smart people to decide. He said, if the blood of an animal has a value in which Allah SWT will not look for one person and two pe but two people to come and decide, what do you think if this case involved the blood of humankind? That one also was gone. And the last thing they, they ask is about Ali bin Abi Talib bin, bin calling himself his. I mean, Ali bin Abi Talib, he rejected the title of Amir al-Mu'minin. They said because if they call him Amir al-Mu'minin, and he told them, no, don't write Amir al-Mu'minin, just write Ali bin Abi Talib. Who was his predecessors in this? Because to them, they said, if he is not Amir al-Mu'minin, then he becomes Amir who? Al-Kafirin. SubhanAllah. They said, if he is not Amir al-Mu'minin, that means he is Amir al-Kafirin. He told them in the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, he is just deleting Amir al-Mu'minin, but Rasulullah asked them to delete Rasulullah. What do you call that? And then they got stuck, you know. And Rasulullah was having a treaty with who? With the kuffar. They told him, we cannot continue unless if he deletes this. He said, remove it. Does that change the reality? No. The same case. So Rasulullah was, was an ummi, and Umar radiallahu anhu used to be among those people who know how to read and write. If you can remember my statement, sometimes I digress a bit to focus on a matter in which we are living in nowadays whereby aql comes first and then the nusus of the sharia. You know, in sharia Allah SWT granted us aql. You know aql, right? Are we supposed to benefit from the aql? Yes. Yes. Why do Allah SWT give us aql? We are supposed to make use of it. But if we have a contradiction between aql and the, and the nakal, nakal means qala Allah wa qala rasuluhu, what shall we go with? Aql or nakal? We shall go with the knuckle first, and then we use the aql to understand, have a proper understanding. But knuckle take the preference before, before the aql. But you might have nowadays some people, they are using the aql first, although they know that the knuckle says something, but to them they don't care. Because they believe that knuckle might be wrong, but aql doesn't be wrong at all. I don't know which aql are they talking about. You know? Because if they ponder a bit, they know that aql, in most instances, especially our aql, when there is no support from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is always going in the wrong direction. Umar was very, a very patient person, and this will be reflected inshallah in, in the near future. And he's very eloquent when he speaks. He knows the language and he speaks fluently. And a very strong. This one, I guess, you don't need anyone to talk to you about the strength of Umar and his power. And uh, when he debates, he usually wins. Okay, very expert when it comes to the d d debate, and in the explanation, it's rarely that you can have Umar talking to a person and at the same time, he doesn't convince you or he doesn't make you understand that which he's talking about. And he used to be during the time of Jahili era, he used to be the Safir for the Quraysh. A Safir means ambassador. When they are in a state of clash between them and other nations, they used to send uh, certain types of people. One of them is Umar radiallahu anhu to go and meet the enemy and talk to them on behalf, of, on behalf of the community. So these are some of the features of Umar radiallahu anhu during the time of the Jahili uh, period. As I said, I'm not going to dwell that much on it. So let's move to Islam. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam comes and arrives in Makkah, you know that Islam was 
uh, propagated in in secret for three years. Rasulullah did not have ability to to invite people in secret. So people have been accepting Islam in secret for almost three years. And then after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked him to start exposing the truth to everyone. And you already know the story. Uh, in the year six of the Nubu'ah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, Umar radiallahu anhu accepted Islam at the age of around 26 to 27. You know, one of the, one of the youth. And he used to be who he was and a person who is very harsh okay people used to get scared of him he rarely makes jokes in his life rarely make jokes you know, almost serious and maybe that's the reason why Umm Kulthum rejected him we're going to see this inshallah in in the near future there are a lot of stories attributed to the way he accepted Islam I will focus on one which I believe to be authentic inshallah you know the case of uh, Umm Abdullah to Hantamama ibn Ha Amir ibn Rabia. They were about to move to Abyssinia. You know the migration to, to Habasha. They were going to that place. So she happened to be in a place where the son has to go and prepare something for them. And then she was waiting for the son to come back. And subhanAllah, they are making this in secret because if the non Muslim knows that they are going out, they might interfere and harm them before they leave. So they were hiding the truth, you know. Where exactly are they going? But the Quraysh know that people are going to, to Habasha. Umar came to her. And he asked her, Umar Abdullah, where are you going? It looks like she's going to somewhere else. She told him, actually, to be honest with you, you guys don't want us here. We cannot practice our religion. We don't have freedom anymore. Although we belong to the community, but we don't have freedom anymore. So we are just going out of this place, looking for a place where we can approach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala peacefully. Umar, when he heard that, he says, that means people started to leave Makkah. And this is the Firaq. Firaq, Firaq means separation. Okay, you guys are going to be separated from us. And this is too much for us. But if this is what you have decided, he said, Ma'akillah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be with you. Somebody who used to punish the Muslims when they accept Islam, and today he is telling somebody who is going to migrate, he is telling them, Ma'akillah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be with you. So she was so happy with that. When the son comes, uh, Amir, Ibn Rabia, when he comes, he says, Is there anything happened with you guys? She said, No, except that Umar came here. He said, Umar? He was wondering, how come Umar passed this place and you're still okay? So he asked, he said, Umar? She said, yes, Umar. Okay, so what happened? She told him exactly what Umar said. He said, it looks like you are thinking of Umar accepting Islam in the near future. Because the way she narrated the story, she has some hope that Umar might accept, accept Islam in the future. What did he say? He told his mother, he says, Mom, to be honest with you, this assumption is wrong. He said, the day you see Umar accepting Islam, you have to be sure that the donkey of his father is already Muslim. What is he trying to say? It is impossible Umar to accept. Everyone can accept Islam, but, but Umar. If you see Umar Muslim, that means the Himar of Khattab also is Muslim. Can Himar become Muslim? No. What does that mean? Umar can never become Muslim. And who was right in this case? Umar or the mother? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, the son or the mother? The mother. And that's why my brothers and sisters, I will have a waqfah here to advise you when you're given da'wah, don't you ever make a conclusion before you reach a person. You will never be patient. If you already decide that this person will not listen, you will not be patient with him. Your job is to convey the message. If he doesn't accept it today, he might accept it tomorrow. Is that clear? That's the reason why prophets and the messengers of Allah SWT, they live with their people for a very long period of time. Nuh was with them for 950 years and he never get bored of it. And subhanAllah, many of those rusul of Allah SWT, they end of their life without having a single person who is following them. Or only a few of them accepted them. Did they fail in their da'wah? Never. Because success in da'wah means nothing but you maintaining the righteousness, which is called istiqama, being patient, 
and inviting others to that righteousness patiently and being patient with the dawah. If you die while not having anyone accepting you, that's a success from your side. That's why all of the messengers of Allah must have succeeded in their message, including those one who are not followed by, by anyone. I close this session with this small mention of Allah SWT in Surah Al-A'raf when he talks about Ashab al-Sabt. Who are the Ashab al-Sabt? Who are the Ashab al-Sabt? The, the Jews, right. Okay, Bani Israel. Allah SWT told them that you're not allowed to work on Tuesday. True or false? Saturday. I just want to wake you up. So they are not supposed to work on Saturday, right? Okay. Uh, what happened is those people they do not adhere to the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They try to play games with Allah. As usual, this is what the Jews were doing. Allah told them, do not take from the fat, the white meat. What did they do? They melt it, they take the oil, and they sell the oil, they use the money. Allah cursed them because of this. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa told us, he says, do not ever intend to validate that which is invalid Islamically using the same tricks as the Jews. To mention, to make those which are haram, halal, be adnal here. Silly tricks which a person might think that Allah SWT doesn't know. You have a lot of transactions, people are dealing with them. I'm telling you, these are nothing but following the tricks of the Jews and the Christians. So what did they do? Allah says, do not catch fish, because th that was their job, people in that community, on Saturday. So, and Allah SWT tests them, and this is what Allah SWT usually do. You look for something, Allah SWT will grant you the thing and will put a condition. And the condition usually used to be very simple. But unfortunately, no nation ever complied with the condition set up by Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the reason why when the Ummah of Muhammad SAW came, and they tried to ask for something like that, Allah SWT refused to give. And he told Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the reason why we refuse to give you, it is nothing but the fact that the nation before you, they used to deny and go against the conditions set, by, set up by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in that place, Allah SWT told them, do not catch fish, but he tested them at the same time. On Saturday, there are a lot of fish. On Sunday, no fish. Monday, no fish. Any, no fish in any other day except on Saturday. On Saturday, you can catch the fish with your hand. Other than that, no fish. If they can be patient, it's going to take a place for a few moments, and then a last matter will take it off, then they can come back to the normal life. Allah is the thief. But subhanAllah, they fail. They try to play game with Allah. They bring their net, nets and their traps. They put them on Friday. Allah says, do not do it on Saturday. They bring it on Friday. So on Friday, no fish. On Saturday, the fish will come and get trapped by what? The net. According to them, net is the one that gets it, not us. So they will not come and get it on Saturday. They will come and take it on Sunday. They think they are playing game with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala watches what they do it. That community was divided into three groups. The first group, they're the criminals. The second group, they're those people who are given da'wah. And the third group, they're the middle one. They're the people who are not participating in the da'wah, but unfortunately, they are demotivating the, the du'at. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَلَمَّا نَسُوا مَا ذَكِّرُوا بِهِ أَنْ جَيْنَ الَّذِينَ إِنْهَوْنَ عَنِ السُّوءُ وَأَخَذْنَ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا بِعَذَابٍ بَئِيسٍ the last group, they spoke to the, first, the second group who was giving da'wah. They said, لِمَا تَعِذُونَ قَوْمًا إِلَّهُ مُهُلِكُمْ أَوْ مُعَذِّبُهُمْ عَذَابًا شَدِيدًا They said, what's wrong with you? You're wasting your time giving da'wah to somebody that you know Allah SWT is going to punish him very soon. Why do you waste your time? And subhanAllah, look at the justification they, they, they gave them. They said, مَا عَذِرَةً إِلَىٰ رَبِّكُمْ وَلَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَّقُونَ they say, first, we're given da'wah to have an excuse. If we go back to Allah SWT, we're going to be questioned by Allah. What did you do when you see that person committing sin? Did you participate in reminding him? They say, we have no answer to that. That's why we're trying to provide this justification. That's the first thing. First, to send our excuse to Allah SWT. Allah has seen what we have done. We try our best. But this is beyond our control. And the second one, I like it so much. They said, وَلَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَّقُونَ Maybe they will fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yesterday they did not listen, but today they might listen. 
Who is worse than Fir'aun in this life? <laughs> yes, I know he's going to say there are many, but some might argue with you that they don't reach Fir'aun. You know Fir'aun, right? <laughs> there are Fara'ina a lot, maybe. Wallahu alam. But there are people when you see them, mashallah, a'udhu billah, they're worse than Fir'aun. I was going to say, mashallah, a'udhu billah, they're worse than Fir'aun. But anyway, look at Fir'aun. I believe the one that you invite him to the truth, you're calling him upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I don't think you can compare him with Fir'aun. Allah knows that Fir'aun will never accept Islam. But for the purpose of training, training us how to give da'wah and to leave this part of the tawfiq with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah sent Musa. He says, Idhab, you and Harun, qula lahu qawla layyinan la'allahu yitadakkara wa yakhsha. He said, when you go to him, speak to him, be very gentle and soft with him. Maybe he will reflect. Allah knows that you will never, but in terms of our own understanding, this person, we don't know what Allah SWT will conclude with his life. So my job is to give da'wah, not to make conclusion. But unfortunately, as I tell you, uh, as I told you, people before they give da'wah nowadays, they make a conclusion. This person will never listen. You hear a person who will tell you, you're just wasting your time, this one will never listen. And this is wrong. So Allah SWT says, those one, they told them we're giving da'wah because we want to have excuse to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first. And secondly, we don't know. Maybe today they might listen to the truth. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that they will not reflect. And he destroyed the criminals. And let me conclude with this to tell you how dangerous it is for you to be in a community where the da'wah is needed, but you fold your arms. You don't give da'wah. It's very dangerous to live in the midst of a community who is in need of the da'wah and you're not given the da'wah. Allah SWT says, When they forgot that which they have been reminded with, by who? By the good ones and the du'at. Allah says, please do listen to this. Huh? He said, we, we protected those people who were reminding people to participate in good and to stay away from the sin. Who were the ones who were protected? The du'at. He says, And those criminals who committed the sins, we hold them accountable of their sins. The scholars ha have this question which remains up to date. We're looking for an answer to this question. What happened to those demotivators? Those people who are more demotivating others when they're giving the da'wah. Allah keeps quiet. He doesn't mention anything about them. But if you read the ayah properly, you have no option except to include them among those people who are destroyed, most likely. Because he says we have protected only those people who are reminding others to be part of the righteousness. And we destroyed the zalimin. A zulm doesn't necessarily mean you committing the sin mubasharatan against the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A person also might commit oppression against himself. Zulm doesn't mean that you're cheating somebody or you're oppressing another person. Zulm also means you're oppressing yourself. If you live in a place and you're supposed to give da'wah, but you're not giving the da'wah according to your capability, you are a varim for himself. Question is going to come on the Day of Judgment. So that's the reason why Rasulullah so in many places mentioned the fact that it is not easy and it's very dangerous for a person to live in a community that is in need of da'wah, but at the same time, he is not giving given the da'wah. So this is the, the qissa that led to the Islam of Umar. There is another story mentioned by them, but this one I couldn't find any chain of narration that is authentic for this uh, story, so I will not mention it. But I guess you already know the story, the story of Sa'id ibn Zaid, who is a family member of Umar radiallahu anhu, and he's married to uh, Fatima, one of the, also the family members of Umar radiallahu anhu, his sister actually in particular, and Umar slapped him according to the story. So they mentioned that the chain is not uh, authentic, so I don't want to dwell on it. But this is the first event that took place which softened the heart of Umar. Okay? He has the green light and let Umar to look for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he accepted Islam from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When he accepted Islam, he told the believers, I don't see the reason why we're 
we still given da'wah in, in Tikrit. And now he told them, I want my Islam to be, to be in public. Yeah. Abu Dhar al-Gifari, when he accepted Islam, he told Rasulullah sallam, why can't you go to those people and let them understand Islam, you know? Nobody tell, tell them Islam, you know? He just now accepted Islam, but he feels responsible to give da'wah. Rasulullah told them, relax. Time is not yet. You know, you cannot go and publicize the da'wah now. He said, no, Ya Rasulullah, Wallahi, they have to hear the truth. As a Bedouin, he just went to the Kaaba and he met those gangsters, you know, surrounding the Kaaba and he told them, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. They came, they beat him up. They were beating him. Al Abbas came and he found them beating him. He looked at his face, he found that this is from the tribe of Gifar. And they're also gangsters, you know. They used to intercept the, the caravan and get everything they have. He told them, Wallahi, if you guys succeeded in killing this person and, and you know that he's from the Gifar, Quraysh are going to die in this place out of hunger. The Gifar will never agree with your with you caravan to pass through, through their place. They let him because of this. And when he went to Rasulullah wasallam with all of those things on his body, Rasulullah wasallam told him, we told you, do not go. He said, Ya Rasulullah, tomorrow also I'm going. And he did that three times. But Umar, people did not stop him that much, you know, because he has built in power in himself to defend himself. And he's part of the community. It's not that person that you can joke with. That's why he went to Abu Jahl first, trying to announce that he's Muslim now, you know. He knocked on the door, he told, when Abu Jahl comes out, he said, how can I help you, Ibn al-Khattab? Umar said, do you know that I accepted Islam? He said, no, don't do that. He said, no, I did. <laughs> Abu Jahl knocked, locked the door on his face. Umar went to another one also. He told him, that one also closed the door on his face. He realized that this is going to take time, going to their house. So he asked the question, who is that person that can announce my Islam very quickly? They told him, Jameel. Jameel bin Muammar, or Muammar. This one is the Minister of Information. Abdullah bin Umar said, I was there when my father approached him. He just told him that, Ibn Jameel, uh, Jameel, do you know that I accepted Islam? He said, Subhanallah, ma tarakahu yukmin maqalata. He did not even let him finish his statement. He jumped, get inside the, the Kaaba, you know, the, the Masjid al Haram. And he kept on shouting to the people, Umar accepted Islam, Umar accepted Islam. So that's how the Islam of Umar reached everywhere through this uh, entity. And there was a mention which is also authentic that they, might, they tried to fight him when he also talked to them about Islam. But Alhamdulillah, Allah SWT protected him because of that which he granted him on, of the strength. Okay. So, Lazam al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he accepted Islam and he stayed with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam throughout his life. He participated in all of the battles with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How many battles, how many battles Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam participated in? I thought when you say how is a question, right? How many battles? 27? Not wrong, but incorrect. <laughs> okay, anyway, honestly speaking, there is no precise information about this. But at least come closer to the correct information, then I will accept. <laughs> they said either 19, 17 to 19 battles uh, done by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The rest, they were called Saraya. Saraya is a is a word that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi sent somebody to go and do it, but he did not participate with them. Some scholars said whenever they, they call a, a battle Ghazwa, that means Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was, was there. When they call it Sariya, that means Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not participate in, in the battle. Allahu Alam. That's why they try to justify the battle of Mu'ta. You know the battle of Mu'ta, right? This is the battle where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fought who? The Romans, right? All the people who happened to be their alliance. 200,000 people against only 3,000. But is it correct that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam participated in that battle? 
No, he did not go, right? But they call it Ghazwa to Mu'ta. So some of the historians justified that title given to that war because Rasulullah was in Medina inside the masjid telling them the details about the battle. Okay, when Jafar was taken down, he told them Jafar has gone down. Uh, uh, Zayd ibn Haritha has gone down. And now he told them that Abdullah ibn Rawaha picked up the, 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 the flag and he was holding the flag of the, the banner of the Muslim and uh, the Muslims and he also was killed. So he's telling them the details of the battle. Allah is about to show him what is really going on. So the scholar said is it is like he is participating with them in that in that place. Wallahu Wallahu Ta'ala Alam. So Umar radiallahu anhu participated in all of the battles of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam starting from from the Badr. How do we know that he went to the Battle of Badr? Because of the Qissa of Hatib ibn Abi Balta. You remember the story of Hatib? Okay, when the Prophet ﷺ was about to fight the Meccans, usually Rasulullah ﷺ, before he fights the people, he will try to conceal the information so that nobody will send the, the, the information to his enemy. You know. So he used to, to make things totally concealed and secret. And sometimes, what Rabi Gayriha means if he's going this side, he will tell them this side. They will go this side, and then they will make a U turn somewhere around. You know, but he will never tell because if he tells them we're going this way, people, there are some Uyun, some spies in, in the community, they will go and tell the enemies that we're coming to you. And this is exactly what happened. During the Fatwa Makkah, Rasulullah was going to fight, and he made the information totally concealed. And subhanAllah, Allah SWT supported him in that. No news is going out, no news is going out. And they tried to stop everyone from going out of Medina. He's going to Makkah. So the Meccans were confused. They know revenge is coming because they betrayed Rasulullah SAW. But they do not know when. And they're trying to seek information about that. So one of the companions of the Prophet SAW, whose name was Hatib ibn Abi Balta, he also participated in the Battle of Badr. He wrote a letter to who? To the Meccans, telling them that we are on the way to you. And he gave it to one of his slaves to go and send the letter to the Meccans. Allah SWT informed Rasulullah about the case. Rasulullah SAW sent Ali bin Abi Talib and two other brothers. He told them, You keep going, don't stop until you reach a place called Rawda Tukhah. He said, there is, a, there is a farm called Rawda Tukhah. You go to that place, don't stop. Keep going from Medina until you reach that place. When you reach that place, you will find a woman with a letter. SubhanAllah, that's Mu'jiza. And they said they couldn't see her in any place until that place. They met her. Right after they see her, Ali bin Abi Talib told her, Aina al-waraqa, Aina al-kitab. He said, where's the letter? She said, nobody gave me any letter. They check everything they can check, you know. They couldn't find the letter. They left. On the way, Ali bin Abi Talib says, Wallahi ma kadaba Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam never lied. He said she is carrying the letter, that means she has it. Let's go back to her. They went back to the, to the sister. They told her, either you give us the letter you took from your master, or we are going to take off your clothes and check every place. When she heard that, she wanted to preserve her honor and dignity. You know, what did she do? She said, wait, take it easy. She opens her hair, you know that squeezing things the, the sisters do? Bread, bread, something like that, you know? So she opens, she put the letter inside the hair and she, she closed it. Who is going to think about this, you know? She opened the thing and she bring out the letter, she passed it to them. They went back to Rasulullah wasallam. they gave him the letter and Rasulullah wasallam called the man, Hatib ibn Abi Balta. When he called him, Umar ibn al Khattab was there with his sword. Naked, you know, naked means open the sword, you know. And he says, Ya Rasulullah, this is a munafiq. Straightforward. He says, Ya Rasulullah, he's a munafiq. How can he send a letter to our enemy telling them that we are on the way? This is one of the munafiqeen. Rasulullah said, Ya Hatim, why did you do that? And subhanAllah, we, there is a great message here that I will share with you, and I wish you guys will apply it in almost every part of your life. Rasulullah asked him, he said, why did you do that? He said, Ya Rasulullah, I am not a munafiq. And I've never intended to be a munafiq. 
But Ya Rasulullah, what happened was, anyone amongst your companions who used to be in Makkah, they have people to protect their family who remains in Makkah. He said, I am the only one who is left behind with nobody to protect my wealth and nobody to, to protect the balance of my family living in Makkah. So Ya Rasulullah, I was in a state of fear that we might not succeed in this mission. And what will happen if we do not succeed? Whoever doesn't have anybody to protect his wealth and his family members, the kuffar, the, not, the, 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 the pagans of Makkah, they will attack his family. So I decided to do some ma'roof to them, some good thing, good thing to them. In case we fail, then they will not come and kill my family and attack my wealth. He said, Ya Rasulullah, that's the whole thing about the issue. Ya Rasulullah, it never come to our mind to support them in order to win against us, Ya Rasulullah. And guess what did he say? He said, Sadaq. This is also one of the, the few moments that the world will get stuck because up to date, this is what we call a high treason. Al Khiyan al Uzma. When you commit a high treason against an army, usually the penalty is what? Is death. No compromise. But in Islam, there is one principle that exists in life. When somebody did something to you, which is the reason why I said I have a message to you, when somebody did something to you which is wrong, before you hold him accountable of it, please do open his file first to see who he was with you. To be honest with you, in most instances, you will never be able to hold him accountable of that. You're going to forgive. And this is what Rasulullah did actually. And he asked you also to apply the same thing when it comes to living with your spouse. He said, لا يفرك مؤمن مؤمنة إن كره منها خلقا رضي منها خلقا آخر. He said, nobody should hate his wife. Nobody should hate his wife just because she has misbehavior towards him. He said, if you disagree with this attitude, she has a lot of attitudes which are, which are good. And for sure, she's not a shaitan which doesn't have any good in his life. In most instances, when she did something wrong, if you're going to remember the life between you and her, I'm telling you, you're going to close your mouth and keep quiet and forgive and overlook. That's why one of the scholars said, I don't know how your wife is, but one of the scholars said, if people are going to look at this hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the vast majority of the problems between the families will be resolved by themselves. There are a lot of issues which are taking place in the family life, and they're taking place simply because people are not adhering to the advice of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Hatha ibn Abi Balta was released by Rasulullah. Why did he release him? When Umar tried to attack him, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Umar, what's wrong with you? He said, Ya Rasulullah, he's a munafiq. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, no. He's not a munafiq. And the case should be closed right after this. Umar said, Ya Rasulullah, khan Allah wa rasulahu wal mu'mineen. He deceives the last martyr and the prophet and the believers. So when Umar was trying to hit him, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Umar, what's wrong with you? Didn't you know that this man participated in the battle of Badr? Umar knows this because he's one of them. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, didn't you know he participated in Badr? Umar said, yes. He said, وَمَا يُدْرِكَ يَا عُمَرْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ اطَّلَعَ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِ أَهْلِ بَدْرٍ فَقَالَ يَا أَهْلِ بَدْرٍ إِفْعَلُوا مَا شِئْتُمْ فَإِنِّي قَدْ كَفَرْتُ لَكُمْ He said, don't you know that Allah SWT looked at the heart of the people of Badr and he made this announcement and tell them, all oh, the people of Badr, do whatever you want. فَإِنِّي قَدْ كَفَرْتُ لَكُمْ I forgive all of your sins. Somebody might say, what is this? That's mean they do whatever they want and then at the end of the day, they go to paradise. All that you have to do, go to Badr. And then after that, do whatever you want, right? No, it wasn't like that. You know what was the secret behind that? Because those people at that moment, they attained the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, if Allah loves a person, he will call Jibreel alayhi salam, and he will tell Jibreel that I love this person, you should love him. And then Jibreel will call upon the angels and tell them that Allah loves this person, you also should love this person. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will spread the love of this person on earth. You will see sometimes even the animals that harms others, but this person is, is an exception. That's when the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is being cast on a person. And when you reach that moment, so what happens is Allah says, Kuntu sam'ahu alladhi yasma'u bihi. 
I'm going to be his ears, the ears that he listens with. And wallahi, sometimes it is so amazing, you know, the, 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 the distance between you and a sin, or a person and a sin is very bit, but then Allah SWT will bring something to interfere. There's a law from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there are entities on earth. They reach this situation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put an eye of protection on them. They then go against the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And even if it happens, they do it by mistake, they quickly come back. And this is what we know to be part of the history of all of those people who participated in Badr. They maintain their righteousness. You know, they're not like the way we think that since Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted them this, then they go and relax. You know, in this life, there are some people hanging around some so-called scholars. At the end of the day, the sheikh will give him a key. You know the key, the key to the room? The metal one. And tell him this is the key to paradise. And you still have some people who believe in that. SubhanAllah. We still have some people who believe in that, that he's holding upon the key to paradise. What is the significance of that? He doesn't pray. He doesn't fast. He commits all kinds of stupidities. And when you talk to him, he tells you, because I already have the key to paradise. Ya akhi, why do you pray? You pray for, for Jannah, I have the key here with me. Look at the guru. You know. But the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they were granted the firdaus by Allah, uh, I'm sorry, the paradise by Allah, but still they're very dedicated to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that was the time Umar knows that because he also participated in, in the battle of Badr. They said he cried a lot. He couldn't even manage to hold the sword that he was trying to kill. Hatib ibn Abi Balta with it. But do remember this lesson, my brothers and sisters. Forgive your brothers and sisters. When somebody did something wrong to you, forgive him. Try to understand the life of this person, who he was. Before you think of action, think of forgiveness. If there is any room for you to do musama and forgive, do it. Allah SWT will deal with you in, in this way. Kamata, do you know? Today, I always have my simple example. I got hit by people a lot okay in ui also three times people get me you know, next to this place also twice okay i will not mention who the last one and in all of them i'll tell them go go okay the last one was a student who i gave him a signal you know when you were going to turn you give a signal you know subhanallah i th i think he's sleeping right after i turn the guy gets me so i come out he comes out his guy got destroyed destroyed Mine is a bit okay. He was trying to apologize. I told him, let's go. A day comes when my turn comes. I hit somebody for the first time. And that person comes out. I gave them my card. I said, please, this is my card. This is my number. When I go to the mechanic and check and see whatever happens, that do let me know. Inshallah, I will find a way out. Come and pay you back. Never call. Never look. When I told one of my friends, he said, definitely you're wali, because this type of people never forgive, you know. <laughs> so I said, it's not the issue of wali, you know, it's not the issue of wilaya, but it is maybe because you never hold others accountable of what they did wrong against you, then Allah wants to treat you in, in that way. They said, kamata dinu, to them. Okay, you take loan from others, they're going to take loan from you. Amilun nasa bin thilima tuhibu an yu amiluk. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam married from the daughter of Umar radiallahu anhu. So he is part of the family members of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam bil al-Musahara. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam married from his daughter. Who was the daughter of Umar that was married to Rasulullah? Hafsa radiallahu, radiallahu anha. And she used to be under the control of one of the companions of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who died in Medina. And then uh, and Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was there in Medina. Umar radiallahu anhu was looking for somebody to go with her. You know, that community is a community of cooperation. They don't leave somebody, I mean, a wife can, doesn't stay when she lost the husband like that. You find this in our own contemporary era, but in the past, there has to be somebody who's going to conceal her affairs and go, and go with her. So Umar radiallahu anhu was looking for a righteous person to, to take his daughter. Is it a good thing for a father to do that? To look for a good one to go with his daughter. Some people might say this is so embarrassing. It's like there is no way out until you go and advertise the girl. But it's a good idea for you to do that. Yes, it's a good idea for you to do that. Is it a good idea that a girl should propose to take somebody? Is it a good idea? The brothers will say, why not? 
that uh, sister who came to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and gave her sab to him. He's the only one who can marry without paying the mahar. They called her wahibatu nafsaha lin Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam has no intention to marry her. He looked at her and then he put his head down. One of the companions said, Ya Rasulullah, if you don't want, I want. And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam asked her, she agreed with that. Anyway, at the end of the day, they married. When Anas ibn Malik, who was there, he reached home, his daughter told him, Dad, I don't know how, how, how can a sister go and present herself? This is so embarrassing. She, little, she really belittled us. How can a sister go and present herself to a, to a man? You know? Anas smacked her. He says, keep quiet. She's proposing herself to who? To Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's why Rasul, uh, the, the scholars said, if that person qualifies, because the norm is that woman is matluba and a man is talib. According to the cultural practices here, we are always the tulab, right? You look for, for a wife. She doesn't go and look for people. You go and look for her. So when she presents herself, it's like now she's becoming, you know, Allah SWT to put them in that state of respect. They don't go and look. You have to go and look for it. But is it okay for them to go and look for somebody? Yes, it's 100% okay. But the scholar said that person has to really qualify that looking for. Depending on the case of Rasulullah wasallam. Otherwise, it would be really bad for a sister to introduce herself to somebody who is one of the losers. Okay? He has to be excellent in terms of manner. He has to be excellent in terms of the religion. We're not talking about scholars. No, we're talking about somebody whose religion is okay and whose manners and attitudes are okay. She can introduce herself. So Umar radiallahu anhu, he was looking for a good person to take his daughter. He started with who? Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. He went to Abu Bakr. He told him, what do you think? My daughter lost her, hus her husband. Please, can you go with her? Abu Bakr kept quiet. Umar got annoyed because this is a close friend to you after Rasulullah. But then you, talk you talked to him about this case. First of all, it's not easy for a father to introduce his daughter to somebody. It was so embarrassing. But he agreed with that because Abu Bakr is one of the best. You know? He doesn't mind. But Abu Bakr keep quiet. Did not even talk to him about that. Umar was annoyed. He went to Uthman. He told Uthman the same thing. Uthman told him, my dear brother, actually, I've already decided not to marry at this moment. Uh, if my decision is positive, I will definitely uh, do it. But this, these days, I don't want to marry. He said the reply of Uthman was easier to be tolerated than the reply of Abu Bakr And subhanAllah, after a few days, Rasulullah proposed to marry her. And Omar was very happy. He was like telling Abu Bakr, yeah, you see, who cares about you? <laughs> this is Rasulullah, you know. So he met Abu Bakr. When he met Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr told him, listen, the reason why I did not even reply you was because I don't want to talk about something which Rasulullah already talked about. He said, I heard him mention in Hafsa in one of the majalis. And usually when he mentioned a woman in that way, most likely he's going to propose for, for the marriage. So I don't want to talk about something which Rasulullah has interest in it. And he says, I was just waiting to see, maybe I was wrong in my assumption. I was just waiting to see, maybe Rasulullah would decline. If he declined, I'm definitely going to propose to marry, to marry her. So that's how, so went to, uh, that's how she went to Rasulullah And she was a very dedicate, a dedicated person in terms of religion, like the father himself. Rasulullah once divorced her. How many wives the Prophet Sallallahu married? How many he married? Do you realize in every answer you gave me, that answer would be wrong? At least this one should be correct. How many wives the Prophet Sallallahu married? I think all of them are correct. You know? Alhamdulillah. <laughs> According to the most authentic opinion, the Prophet ﷺ married those whom he stayed with, 11 wives. Okay, 11. Two of them died before his death, and he left nine. That's why some of you will say nine. You're correct also in this regard, because these are the ones that Rasulullah ﷺ left. Zainab bin Khuzayma and Khadija bin Khuwaylid, they are the ones who died uh, before Rasulullah ﷺ. 
Hafsa was one of them. And there was a time Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa divorced her. Why did he divorce her? This is the issue between husband and wife, right? You don't interfere. You don't ask about the detail. What is the reason why you don't ask? If they don't share with you, you keep quiet. But sometimes, you know, that compatibility will be removed. So it happens that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa divorce. And when he divorced her, what was the thing that protected Hafsa? Her religion and her righteousness. You know, Jibreel came to him immediately after the divorce. He says, Allah SWT is commanding you to, the, to take her back immediately. And Allah SWT is asking you the following question. How can you dare to divorce a person who is very dedicated to Allah SWT, fasting in the daytime, and also praying to Allah SWT at night on the daily basis? SubhanAllah, religion and the deen protected her because losing Rasulullah is not easy. And now she's going to lose Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought her back because of her righteousness and her attitude. So my sisters and my brothers, wallahi the most important factor to preserve your marriage is your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You want your family life to be preserved, get Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala involved in your life. If there is no Allah in your house, everything is going to happen. You know? Let Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be part of the, the life in the house, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will support you and protect you from anything that can ruin your marital life with your, with your wife. Umar is one of the most knowledgeable people amongst the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And uh, we know this because Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saw a dream. And in that dream, he saw himself drinking uh, milk, yogurt. And then uh, he passed it to Abu Bakr. Uh, uh, he passed it to Umar Radiallahu Anhu. And they asked him, how did you, he drank it? A lot, and then he passed it to Umar radiallahu anhu. And they asked him, What was the interpretation you have towards that dream? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, It was knowledge. Okay, dream could be interpreted. The scholar said, We have three types of dreams those from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and those from your soul, and those from, from shaitan. You have the hadith and nafs, and you have dream from shaitan, and you have dream from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, could be possibly interpreted. The one from, from shaitan, you already know them. True? Yeah, you see in a dream you're fighting yourself. You're fighting some jinns. You know, these are all from shaitan. In the time of Rasulullah wasallam, somebody told him, Ya Rasulullah, I saw myself chasing my head. You know, the head is ru rushing, running away from me. And I was chasing, following the head, trying to bring it back. The Prophet wasallam got annoyed with him. And he told them, you guys shouldn't narrate to us the stupidities that happens in your dreams. So what you should do if you see those type of dreams, you shouldn't share with anyone. Do we have them a lot? Yes, we do have them. What is the way out from these dreams? Is to sleep in the way Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam commanded you to sleep. What is the best way of sleeping? You make wudu first, okay? If you can pray, pray. You make wudu first, and then recite ayatul kursi before sleeping. At least ayatul kursi. And then you sleep on the right, on the right side. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this is the Sunnah he gave. And I'm telling you, my brothers and sisters, I can guarantee you, in most instances, you will never have a bad dream if you maintain the Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because shaitan doesn't approach a person who is upon this nature. These dreams which are bad, they are coming from shaitan. So when there is an angel protecting you until the next morning, shaitan cannot have influence on you even if you are, if you are sleeping. The second types of dream, these are dreams which are part of the translation of your own self. You have something, you're thinking about it, but then you see it in a dream. Those people who are about to marry or you're about to travel, you know, you will see a lot of dreams, right? The thing is happening, you know. These are all translation and interpretation of your, of your dream. But when you see a dream that is straightforward, it is not linked or connected to something that you are busy thinking about, especially when you see it at night before Fajr, these dreams usually they have interpretation. They could be bad, they could be good. And it is very dangerous for you to look for somebody to interpret the dream. Because if you made a mistake, you might have a bad consequence based on that mistake as long as that person knows how to interpret the dream. That's why Rasulullah said, if you see a dream, you shouldn't send it to anyone to interpret the dream except somebody who is a knowledgeable person or somebody who is really nasah to you. Nasah to you means somebody who can take, tell you a good advice. 
But other than that, you are supposed to conceal the dream, whether they're good or they're bad. You just leave them with yourself. Don't share with, with anyone. Some dreams, they're so good in a way they can't be the reason why you will lose your life. The case of Yusuf is very, very important for us to understand how bad is inter I mean, narration of a dream to somebody if this dream is good. That person might be somebody who will show jealousy to you. It might cause you your life. What I'm trying to say is whenever you see a dream, look for, if you want it to translate it, no problem. But look for somebody who knows how to, how to translate. Look for somebody who can translate it properly because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ar-ru'ya ala rijli ta'irin. He says dreams, they are hanging around the leg of a bird. They usually don't happen until the time somebody interprets the dream. He said, if fussirat waqat. When it gets interpreted, then the dreams are going to take place most likely in the way the interpretation is given to you. And he says, Usually the first interpretation is the one that will take the preference. So what is the best way out in this regard? If it is good, ask Allah SWT to give you that which you see. If it is wrong, don't share with anyone. When you wake up, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, speak three times at your right, right, uh, left side and استعذ بالله سيعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم and then ask Allah SWT to protect you from it evil consequence it will never never happen be in light Allah so Rasulullah SAW used to do the interpretation and he says that the interpretation of a yoga that he saw is referring to the knowledge and he gave Umar radiallahu anhu to drink from it that's why he is considered to be among the companions of the Prophet SAW so practically one of the most knowledgeable people and he's a man of prestige. And I guess each and every one of you knows this. People used to get scared of Umar radiallahu anhu uh, a lot. There was a time Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was speaking to a group of sisters. Rasulullah sallallahu was very lenient. And they used to raise up their voice. You know, Rasulullah sallallahu was speaking to them and they're raising up their voice to him. And then after a few minutes, Umar radiallahu anhu said, Assalamu alaikum ya Rasulullah. Right after this, the narrator says, Tabadirna al-hijab. Each and every one of them sit properly and try to be a bit far from Umar radiallahu anhu. So they stop talking, they stop speaking. When Umar radiallahu anhu approached the place. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was laughing when he sees that. And uh, Umar radiallahu anhu asked him, Ya Rasulullah, adhak Allahu sinnak. May Allah swt make you laugh. Well, why are you laughing? He said, I'm laughing because of these sisters. They are raising up their voice, but when you talk, they keep quiet, all of them. Umar told them, I adu wajah anfusihim. He called them the enemy of themselves. He says, you are scared of me? You're not scared of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? They said, yes, because you're too harsh. That's why we are scared of you. And this is the reason why he lost the daughter of Ali bin Abi Talib. Umar Kurthu. He was once proposing to marry her. Uh, she does, she does uh, I'm sorry, not the daughter of Ali bin Abi Talib, daughter of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Sister of Aisha radiallahu anha. Umar wants to marry her. Aisha asked her, Umar proposed to marry you. What do you think about that? She said, I don't want. Aisha said, girl, wake up. This is the Khalifa. This is Umar. She said, I don't want. SubhanAllah, this is when freedom is, is taking place, right? And right is given to the due honors. Nowadays, you have people who are forcing their daughters to marry somebody who they don't want. And at the time of Rasulullah it did not exist. And my message to the parent is, they have to know that, Wallahi, this is dhulm. Wallahi, this is dhulm. This is oppression. The girl shouldn't bring a loser. She has to get the permission of the father. But at the same time, the father doesn't have a right to force her to marry somebody who she doesn't want to live with. These are matters of what? Honor and dignity. She's going to give it to somebody who she hates. And the father and the mother are not going to live with her in that. Some of them, they will be depressed throughout their lives. And the parent, they are there in, in, in their own territory, living their good life. And they let her suffering from this person, you know. Due to the cultural practices. I guess the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu is more deserving to be followed than the cultural practices. Whatever this culture might be, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam cancel a marriage when it happens between a sister and a brother when that sister doesn't like the marriage. So it is like this. She shouldn't bring somebody who is not qualified. If she does, the father do have a right to say no, and it is no. But at the same time, he doesn't have a right to force her to marry somebody who she doesn't want to marry. He can tell her, we don't want this, bring somebody else. 
because this person has this, this person has that. And also my message to the sisters, when your father says, no, I would never stop. When the father said, <laughs> when your father said, when you, okay, I will stop, inshallah. When your father said, no, you shouldn't take the next decision. Because what some sisters do, which is also part of their right given to them by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But to be honest with you, we have to think smartly, you know. Sometimes there is sharia and there is also advice, you know. That woman, when the Prophet ﷺ told her, he said, please agree to accept your husband to come back to you. She said, Ya Rasulullah, is it a command from you or this is nothing but an advice coming from you? Are you just advising me or this is a command from Allah? He said, no, I'm just advising. She said, Ya Rasulullah, I don't want him. She wants to know that this is a command from Allah or this is just an advice. She said, I don't want. So that is, you might ask me and I will tell you, yes, Islamically, if the father says no, Islamically, if the father says no, and there is no justification, let's say she brings somebody who is perfect, but unfortunately he doesn't speak the same language. He's not from the same country. And sometimes, subhanAllah, the same country, the same race, the same language, the same color, the same nature, but he's not from the same family. The family will reject. Can she move to the next wali? Yes, she goes to the next wali. The next wali also reject. The next wali also reject. What next? She can go to the hakim, to the king, to arrange the marriage. That would be okay. But is it advisable? No. Because she doesn't know what will happen in the future about that marriage. That person might not be able to maintain the marriage. When he divorces her, she goes to where? We have cases where when the divorce happened, then the sister have no any other place to go because she's rejected by the family. That's why patience and advice is always needed here. So when she told uh, Umm Kulthum, Umm Kulthum said, I don't want him. Aisha did not force. She said, accept him. This is the Khalifa, Amir al-Mu'minin. She said, I don't want. She said, why? She said, because he's too harsh. I cannot stand his life. Everyone is mentioning the same thing, you know. She said, it's too harsh because they are reading Umar from far distance, you know. At home, he has a wife, right? And this wife sometimes commands him, you know, this is Umar. She shout also when he does something wrong, you know. We have the case of that person who came to Umar to seek his advice. But then he heard the wife also shouting. So he left. Umar came out. He said, are you the one who called me? He said, yes. He said, what, what is this? You call me and you run away? He said, yes, because I come to complain to you about my wife. But then I found your wife also shouting. They said in Arabic, The one who lacks something cannot give it to anyone. So you cannot control your wife. How can you control the wives of others? You know? Subhanallah. So she doesn't accept. And she asked Abdul Rahman bin Awf to go and talk to her. And he talked to her. Uh, I'm sorry, to go and talk to him. He talked to him. Omar, close the page. He doesn't say she has to. I have a person that I speak to him personally. He memorized the Quran. Oh, I'm sorry. I did not speak to him personally. But the girl spoke to him personally. He memorized Quran. She told him, brother, I hate you. I don't want to stay with you. And you have the Quran with you. You know that Sunnah says you shouldn't stay with somebody who doesn't want to stay. He said you have to. SubhanAllah. And this is Umar radiallahu anhu. When Aisha told him she said she doesn't want, he said, I wish her all the best. A sister came to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi This is the best example. Leave Umar aside. A sister came to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. She was the wife, and this is the first night of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This person, he stretched his hand to touch her. She said, "A'udhu billahi mink." When she said that, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam did not say, "I am Rasulullah. You have to stay." You know, I paid the money. I do this and that. He says, you definitely ask the protection of somebody who always protects. He said, go back to your family. Marriage is based on that. You know? Don't you ever stay with somebody who doesn't want to stay with you. That's why I used to say I have five pillars in marriage. Ibrahim's pillars, you know, nobody should go and quote me and say I changed the religion of Allah. <laughs> this uh, advice that I give a person, if you are going to marry, make sure that you observe five things. The girl whom you are going to stay, she loves to stay with you. The parent, the two parents that belongs to her, and your two parents. Any one of them who reject the marriage, try and look for something else. I'm just telling you about what usually happens when one of them is not in agreement with the marriage. You might say, I have a right Islamically to go for it, but think about the consequence. It will never be good when you bring your wife next to your mother and you know that your mother hates her. And she also knows that your mother hates her. 
She will never give you a good life when you are alone with her. So that's what we have to always remember this. Somebody threatened me that my time is up and I did not even reach half of what I intended to say. Okay, so this is Umar radiallahu anhu. Let me just conclude. Uh, so he lived with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam this kind of life. Inshallah, if I can, can I have like one minute? Say yes. What is the person who is said, oh, are you, sorry, I, I thought you are the one who is Allah to me. I will have one minute according to my term, you know. So, so that's Umar radiallahu anhu. He lived with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they said he is the mulham. Mulha means somebody who is inspired by Allah SWT to speak the truth. Okay, that's the best interpretation of it. He wasn't a prophet, but when he speaks, Allah SWT put the truth on his, on his tongue. He says so many statements which happen to be the fact and part of the book of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. That's why he used to say, Quran agrees with me in certain moments and he will mention the thing. He told the wives of Rasulullah SAW, if you are not careful, Allah SWT is going to change you with others. And he tells them, Allah is going to grant him Muslimatin, Mu'minatin, Qanitatin, the ayah you know in Surah al tahrib And right after that, Allah SWT revealed the ayah that says, Asa Rabbuhu, in talaka kunna ayyubdilahu azwadin khayrun min kunna. The same words of Umar Allah SWT used. And he used to tell the Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Rasulullah, yadkhul alayka al-barru al-fajr. Everyone comes to your house. Ya Rasulullah, I think it's not a good idea for you to let this happen. You have to protect your family members. Don't let everyone come inside. Hijab is necessary. Allah SWT revealed the ayah of hijab right, right after that. They went to Mecca. Umar said to Rasulullah SAW, Ya Rasulullah, why can't we pray behind Maqam Ibrahim? Allah SWT sent the ayah that says, وَاتَّخِذُ مِي مَقَامِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ مُسَلَّى So there are a lot of things which happen to Islam which make the Prophet SAW said, if there is anyone among my ummah who is going to be prophet after me, if this is possible, it is not possible. There will be no Rasul, Rasul after Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wala nabi. But he says, if it is possible, Umar is going to be, is going to be the one who will be the prophet after me. But all of these doesn't mean that he is better than, than Abu Bakr. The scholars said, because Abu Bakr kamulat fadailuhu, he already reached the peak. He doesn't need anything to back him up. That's why the strength and the focus, the focus is on and Umar radiallahu anhu, not Abu Bakr. Umar used to say that I wish Allah SWT will take that night with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that Abu Bakr had and to replace it with all of my good deeds. I mean, my good deeds should be taken. I just want that night. So one night of Abu Bakr is equivalent to the life of Umar and Ali bin Abi, Abi Talib. So this is Umar radiallahu anhu during time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We know his mawqif. Almost done, inshallah. We know his mawqif, his position when the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam died. He pulled out his sword and he told the believers, whoever say that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is dead, I will definitely cut off, cut off his head. He says he will never die until he get rid of all of the munafiqeen. He went to talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just like the way Musa alayhi salam went to speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's the reason why many scholars said, Abu Bakr is stronger than Umar because his heart can, can, can be controlled. I mean, he can control his emotions. Umar couldn't control his emotion at that moment. And then Abu Bakr came to Khilafah after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa You already know what happens right after the death of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa If you don't know, you go and look for it, inshallah. And uh, at the end of the day, the Khilafah was given to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. And Umar was with Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. He participated in almost every single moment, right from the beginning when Abu Bakr was trying to send the Jaish of Osama, the Osama expedition. You know, after the Battle of Mu'ta, Jafar was killed, Zaid was killed, and Abdullah ibn Rawaha was killed. Zaid is the father of Osama, and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa prepared a war, uh, uh, an army to go and take revenge against those criminals who killed these companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And who began the, bat the battle? They were the ones who began, because they killed one of the ambassadors of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And according to the system, even in the old days, as well as the contemporary era, ambassadors cannot be killed because they are the connection between you and, and your enemy. If you kill them, then how can you reconcile? You know, so you can fight the people, but when an, an ambassador comes uh, come to you, you don't kill. When you kill an ambassador, this is the clear declaration of war against those, those people. So this is what happened, and that was the reason why he fought them during the battle of the Mota, but they killed those companions of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this army was supposed to depart and go and take revenge, but Unfortunately, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam died right after they left Medina. So they couldn't move. And he told the believers, let them go. And subhanAllah, Umar disagreed with that. Because most of the companions of the Prophet sallallahu participated in, in that battle. 
and Medina is under a threat. Threat from the Romans, threat from the false prophet, Muslim al-Kadhab and his people, and threat from the villages surrounding Medina who are going out of Islam, and some of them not, not paying the zakah. You can say the only place that Islam exists in total is Medina to Rasulullah. And it's not good at this moment to let the army go out. Medina will be naked. Will be okay for everyone to attack. That's why Umar said, yeah, Abu Bakr, it's not a good idea for this army to go. Wait first. Abu Bakr told him, he said, Umar, is there anything happens in your aql? Is there anything wrong with your aql? Umar said, what do you mean? He said, Rasulullah said, let them go. And you are telling me to keep them in Medina? He said, Wallahi, they have to leave. And subhanAllah, look at the smartness. They left. And because of this mission, many of the villages who are intending to go out of Islam, they maintain their religion. Because when they see the success and the victory being given to those army, they decided to remain in remain in Islam. So he beat two birds with one stone. So this is what happened. And you know his participation when it comes to the general Quran, compilation of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was the one who advised Abu Bakr to do that. And alhamdulillah, you can see the benefits. Nowadays, we can have the Quran. And then his Khilafah come. I will fly, inshallah, in one and a half minutes. I can finish, inshallah. So when the Khilafah comes, also people said, we don't agree with him. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, before he died, he knows what happened right after the death of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So he doesn't want to repeat the same scenario. That's why he cut the story short. He decided to let the believer choose whatever they want. But then all of them agree with his decision. They told him, you decide. So he told them, give me a chance. In a few days, inshallah, we'll come up with the decision. <coughs> he talked to Abdurrahman bin Auf. He said, what do you think about Umar? Abdullah bin Abdurrahman bin Auf says that that would be an excellent decision. He talked to Uthman. He said, what do you think about that? Uthman says, that would be an excellent decision. And you have to know that the sarira of Umar is better than what you see outside. Subhanallah. These are the people who understand Umar properly. They told him, no, his inside is clear. His outside is harsh because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but inside is full of mercy. Abdullah, uh, 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 Usaid bin Hudayr also, he said that, uh, and also Saeed bin Zaid, also one of the family members of Umar radiallahu anhu, he also said the same thing, except Talha. Talha ibn Ubaidullah, when Umar asked him, he said, he, he shouted at him. I'm sorry, when Abu Bakr asked him, he shouted at Abu Bakr, he said, what would you say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to ask you about the reason why you appoint Umar to be the one who is leading the Muslims? And you know that he's very harsh. And Rasulullah s.a.w. advised you to be mercy, merciful to everyone. Abu Bakr was very annoyed when he heard this. And he looked at him also, he shouted at him. He said, He said, are you scaring me with Allah s.a.w. concerning this matter? He said, Wallahi, I will never be the person who will go back to Allah s.a.w. with oppression. If Allah asks me, I will tell him, Ya Allah, I left behind me Umar radiallahu anhu. SubhanAllah, he knows what he, he is doing. And afterwards, all of them understand why Abu Bakr chose Umar radiallahu anhu. And that was the way he was chosen by Abu Bakr. And his khilafah was confirmed by consensus of all of the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, including Talha, he himself. So the leadership of Umar was based on nothing except justice and equality and making sure that every single person was at peace. And religion was backed by Umar radiallahu anhu, almost everyone was standing upright. And he has a lot to be mentioned concerning this matter, which I will refer you to the book of, of history. And uh, let's move to the time when he dies. And Umar died at the hand of one of the, the wicked people. And he succeeded in terms of spreading Islam in so many places. I will already say the conclusion. Okay? Okay. He succeeded in many missions. At the hand of Umar radiallahu anhu, the, the, the Romans were defeated, the Persians were defeated, the Crusaders in Palestine also were defeated. And one of the miracles of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa took place in that, in, that, in that moment. So almost you can say the vast majority of, the, of the, the land which are occupied by the people on earth, most of them were led by, by the Muslims. Either they are under control of the Muslims or at the, at the, time, at the same time Islam is on top, on top of them, they cannot do anything. And you can see the wisdom. I wish there is a time to talk about the wisdom behind designing the Khilafah in this way. Wallahi, there is a great wisdom in it. How Allah SWT did not give, uh, give Umar right after Rasulullah because Umar cannot do it at that moment. People need nobody except 
Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. And right after that, Abu Bakr cleansed that which the Muslim community is suffering from. He bring them back to their consciousness. At this moment, Allah SWT took him back because now we have a greater threat from those arrogant nations, you know, out of the community. Abu Bakr cannot do the job. We need somebody like Umar to take care of them. And you can see how he bring them to their knees. Almost all of them, they have to bow for the Islam rather than being enemy of the religion of Allah SWT. And there we go, if you look at the rest, and the subsequent Khulafa who came after Umar radiallahu anhu. Amr ibn Maymun, who has a very strange uh, story also, Bukhari narrated that story. He was the one who reported to us the way Umar ibn Khattab died. He said, I was there praying with Umar radiallahu anhu, Fajr prayer, and then I just heard Umar radiallahu anhu saying, Subhanallah qatalani al ilj You know, or kalb in some narration. He says, Subhanallah, I was killed by this dog, by this idiot person. And he was in prayer. He just said, Allahu Akbar, and then he says, Subhanallah, somebody killed me. And that was uh, Fairuz, okay? Ab Abu Lula al Majusi. He was from the, the Persians, those people who are worshiping the fires, whose grave is venerated and reverenced by some group of people. You know who they are. Until now, they still respect him. They go and worship him, actually. I heard one of them asking Allah SWT to resurrect him with Abu Lula al Majusi. I said, Allahumma, Allahumma Amin. He asked for it. And I say, Allahumma, Ameen. So what did he do? This man went to the masjid, you know. He went to the masjid to pray with the believers. Right after Umar radiallahu anhu said, Allahu Akbar, he bring his knife and he stabbed Umar radiallahu anhu. When he stabbed Umar radiallahu anhu, this part, and then when Umar said, Subhanallah, I'm killed by this person, so people try to trace who is that person. So the man realized that he's going to be in trouble, so he started stabbing everyone, you know. He stabbed around 13 people mentioned by Imam al-Bukhari in that hadith. He said, Mata minhum sab'a. Seven of them died instantly, like, like Umar radiallahu anhu. The rest, they were treated. But when he realized that he's going to be killed, and uh, one of the Muslims just tried to put his, uh, his garment and drive him with it. When he realized that he's going to be killed, he committed suicide and killed himself. Ila nari wa bi masid. So this is how Umar was, was assassinated, and he lived a uh, few days worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, being patient and advising the believers. And before he left, he asked the Muslim to choose one of the six people he announced. And I wish there is a time, wallahi, without exaggeration, this event of uh, the assassination of Umar radiallahu anhu needs from us not one lecture, but two, three, four, five lectures. The hadith mentioned by Bukhari is very long. It has a lot of lessons that the Muslim should know about it. But unfortunately, that guy was showing me times up, times up. So I wish, inshallah, what I said uh, benefit uh, some of you at least. And if you have any question, you can come up with it. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika ashara la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruka wa tubu ilayhi. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We need to go straight forward to the question and answers or... at all <clears throat> because if you look at the battles of Rasulullah Umar's expansion of the Muslim territory was nothing except a continuation of the mission of Rasulullah and almost with no exaggeration in every battle that Rasulullah fought an enemy an army they were the one who started it was mainly based on defense and that was the first thing given to those people 
you know, before Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam fights, and that was the method used by Umar radiallahu anhu. They didn't just go to the people and fight them just like that. Okay, if you look at the battles of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, almost all of them they are based on defense. Some of them they attack Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Some of them they did not attack Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, but Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam got confirmation, which he has no doubt that these people are preparing for that, and they never deny. And for sure, you cannot hear about somebody who is willing to attack you and you just fold your arms. It never happened then and it will never happen in this time of ours. So the same goes to Umar radiallahu anhu. Who are the people who fought Umar radiallahu anhu? They are the Persians. The Persians they fought. Since the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa they started. Their influence started coming and they were so arrogant. And they even planned to take Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So they started. They started moving from that moment. The Romans, they already fought Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in the mortar and they come back to fight Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in the battle of Tabuk. But fortunately they did not, I mean, continue. And they agreed to go back due to the advice given to them by Heraclius himself. When he told them that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was a messenger of Allah and nobody ever fought a prophet and succeed at the same time. That's why they left. You go back to the crusaders. The territory is not theirs. Those are nothing but colonizers and killers. You know, and people who come for nothing except to enslave others. History will tell you this. The place doesn't belong to them also. They're all criminals. So Umar, when he comes, he fought, fought who? The criminals. So there is no way for somebody to say that Islam was spread by the sword. No, it wasn't. The vast majority of the people who accept Islam, they did not accept it because of the sword. Islam fights somebody who is fighting, and this is exactly what was done by, by Umar radiallahu anhu. That's the reason why also, regardless of their enmity, at the same time when Umar reached a place to fight them, he used the advice of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa to, to, to justify the battle. When he says, إِذَا لَقِيتَ عَدُوَكَ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ فَدِعُهُمْ إِلَىٰ ثَلَاثٍ خِصَالٍ Whenever you meet a, a, your enemy from the mushrikeen, he said the first thing, he said your enemy. That means somebody who is at war between you and him. He said you shouldn't fight him just like that. You have to invite them to one of the three things. Ask them to accept Islam. Because when they accept Islam, the case is closed. And wallahi, whoever is honest and not biased, he will understand that Islam is not the religion of killing. Right? That's why Rasulullah when he reached Mecca, Mecca is supposed to be taken to the ground as a revenge. They killed them, they persecuted them. They killed them a very horrific kind of killing, you know. That Ammar ibn Yasir, I mean, his parents, go and see the way they killed them. Just because they say, Rabbun Allah, you know. And they killed some of the companions of Rasulullah. They punished them, they chased them out of their own territory. Today, Rasulullah is back to the place as what? As a victorious person, as a leader. He was supposed to do what those criminals who fought the world in the World War did, you know, and take the city to the ground. But what did he say? He said, relax. And not only that, they said he went and he bent his head to the ground out of humbleness and humility. He wasn't arrogant. And he told them, I forgive them all. Okay? He said, I forgive you all. He doesn't reflect upon the past. He forgive. They did not tell him we accept Islam. He said, I forgive. How can somebody come and tell us that Islam is a religion of sword, sword, sword? He only declared war and uh, blood violation upon nine people. They are so criminal. He said, this one, no forgiveness. Wherever you see them, kill them. The only thing that could be accepted by us for them, from them is, is Islam. You get it? So my answer to this question is that, Omar was doing nothing except the mission of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fighting those people who are enemies to Islam at the first place. The second question is, if Allah knows Firaun will never, Firaun is never going to accept Islam, isn't he like Allah is willing, willingly giving him the hellfire in the Akhirah? Some as long believers nowadays, isn't it the doom for them already? Okay, who said that Allah SWT gave him already the, the hellfire accident? Okay, I have a question to the questioner himself. Was it Allah SWT the one who take Fir'aun by force to hellfire or Fir'aun was the one who decided to choose that way? 
Salam. He chose it. Oh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took him by force to hell. It's like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just taking people randomly. This one go to hell, this one go to paradise like that. You don't have a choice, right? Is it correct? No. Somebody understood this. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, nobody amongst you except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows his position in hell and his position in paradise. Some of you, some of us who are going to hell, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us, and some are going to paradise. Allah know, knows each and every one of, one of us. Where exactly a person is, is going to? Somebody misunderstood. He said, Ya Rasulullah, if the places are already decided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what is the point of practicing the deen then? Because you might be a very dedicated person to Allah, but at the same time, the name is in hell. You go to hell. He said, what is the point of... And you might be just sitting down sleeping, not doing anything, but your name is where? In paradise. And you know, subhanAllah, there are some people who believe in that, you know. They say their name is already written in paradise. They do whatever they want, you know. They do whatever they want. And they believe in the hereafter, Allah SWT will not make a judgment. He was just going to tell everyone to go back to his origin. People of hell will go to help you, of paradise will go to paradise. You know. But this is not the correct understanding. So I put it in this way for you to understand uh, properly that Allah SWT created us human beings and he granted us free will to choose what we want to do. So this freedom of choice is there in everyone. Nobody feels that he is forced by Allah SWT to choose what he doesn't want. We are the one who are making the choice. But how do I deal with these hadiths of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that says Allah SWT already know. Okay, in Qadr, this is one of the, the pillars of, uh, of Iman, right? Al-Iman bil Qadr, we believe in the Qadr. Qadr has four pillars. Please do remember this, huh? four pillars. Number one is knowledge. Number two, Al-Ilm. Number three is Al-Kitaba, writing. Number four is Al-Mashia, the will. Number five, number three actually. Number four is Al-Khalq, the creation. You have Al-Ilm, Wal-Kitaba, Wal-Mashia, Wal-Khalq. Knowledge, writing, and the will, and the last one is al-khalq. So knowledge comes first. Knowledge means Allah SWT knows everything. What did he write in Lohul Mahfud? His knowledge. That's why the creation of Allah, sorry, the creation of Allah, the affairs of the creation from A to Z are written in the Lohul Mahfud before the creation exists. What is he writing? He's writing his knowledge. His knowledge about the deeds and the actions of each and every one of us. What Ibrahim is going to choose, what Karim is going to choose, what Hafiz is going to choose, what Muhammad is going to choose, what Fir'aun is going to choose, what Abu Bakr is going to choose. Allah SWT knows each and every one of us uh, as his choice in detail. So he write every single thing in detail, including your movement. So Allah knows, here's the answer to your question, Allah knows that Fir'aun will never choose to agree with Musa. Was Allah the one who is forcing him to make that choice? No. Allah granted him freedom to choose. He chose not to accept Musa. Allah knows Fir'aun will never get convinced. That's the reason why his name will be written amongst those people who are going to, to hell. Out of the knowledge of Allah that this man will never choose the truth. So he wrote him there. Because he knows what he will be choosing in the future. Not because Allah forced him. That's why that aqidah that says we are forced to do whatever we want, this aqidah is very wrong. And it brings nothing to the community except evil. evil. Because there is an aqidah that says we are forced, we don't have control over our own self. So somebody who committed the crime, this person has no control. They tell you that if you see somebody in the church, they say it's okay because he doesn't bring himself to the church. He sees himself there. The one who drink wine also, he sees himself there. Imagine somebody comes and slap your face and you ask him why he says, Wallahi, I don't know, my hand just went to that place. Huh? What are you going to say? You also get him, you say, Wallahi, I also, my hand went to that place. And you know, Wallahi, people are doing that. In the time of Umar, somebody stole something and Umar was about to cut off his hand. What did he say? He says, Ya Amir al muminin how can you cut off my hand just because I did something which has already been written for me by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What did Umar say? Did he say, no, you're wrong, Allah did not write it? He said, yes, you're right, you're right. Allah SWT has written that you're going to steal. We're not talking about this. But we also, you have to know that Allah has written that we're going to cut off your hand. You know? <laughs> he cut off his hand just like that. He said in the way he has written, and he also wrote that we're going to... 
That's why they said the one who is committing sins dependent on the qadr, why can't he just say to himself that good is written, let me do the good thing. You know? If I want, I can be good. If I want, I can be bad. You know? Why can't I just say, yes, Allah SWT created me to be good and just participate in the good? Do you get the idea? So I want you to go out of this place with a good understanding concerning the matter of qadr. What is written in the Lawh al Mahfuz is the knowledge of Allah SWT about the choices of each and every one of us. And hence the conclusion has been made by Allah who exactly is going to paradise and who exactly is going to, is going to hell. But Allah never forced somebody to do what he doesn't want to do. It is based on our own choices. Otherwise, logically, my brothers and sisters, if we are forced to do what we don't want to do by Allah SWT, then what is the point of sending the messengers then? Why Allah SWT send Rasul to us? If we have no control over our own actions, why is Allah SWT sending the Prophet to us? If we have no control, why is Allah SWT asking you to pray? Do you get the point? But when Allah SWT says pray, that means you can say what? You can say no. And that's the reason why some of us are going to hell and some of us are going to paradise. May Allah SWT make us among the second, second group. So what am I supposed to do concerning the matter of Qadr? I leave you with these two statements. The scholar said, Al Qadr Sirullahi fi khalqihi. Qadr is the secret of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his creation. When I call something secret, what does that mean? We are not supposed to, to interfere. That's why, my brothers and sisters, the vast majority of the deviation in the Muslim community it is based on the Qadr. Most of these groups and sects that emerge and split, split themselves from the Muslims, they emerge because of what? The issue of Qadr. It's a very dangerous area for somebody to go deep inside. That's why the Salaf told you that Allah SWT has written everything and you have to believe in this and Qadr is the secret of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Your job is to chase those commands of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi and do them and stay away from, from the evil. That's why when Suraka Ibn Malik says, Ya Rasulullah, if this is the case, what is the point of practicing in the good deed? What is the point of participating in the good deed? Rasulullah said, No. He said, Try your best to participate in righteousness and good deeds because every single person Allah SWT is creating him and making things easy for him towards that which he created him for. So understand properly, we are not forced to do. What is written by Allah SWT in Allah al Mahfuz is what? The knowledge of Allah SWT about our, our choices. Get it? If you get this properly, then the confusion will be will be removed, inshallah. Uh, the last question for tonight would be... So fast. Since we are on the topic of Khulafa Rashidu, must the Muslims of today strike back, strike to bring back the legacy and establish Khalifa? The first thing to be done is to understand that you are also a Khalifa on earth. Fix yourself first. Subhanallah, in the vast majority of our own attitudes, we always talk about this khilafah, but what khilafah is all about, we don't find it in our own self. No. Be good first. Participate in righteousness. And to be honest with you, my brothers and sisters, the scholars said, Kama kunu alaykum. Just like the way you are, your leaders will be the reflection of your attitudes and your manners. One of the leaders of Banu Umayyah, they said, he gathered the scholars and the members of the community. And then he told them, would you like us to be like Abu Bakr and Umar? They said, yes. He said, you also, you have to be like the people who live with Abu Bakr and Umar. كَمَا تَكُونُوا يُوَلَّا عَلَيْكُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُغَيِّرُ مَا بِقَوْمٍ حَتَّى يُغَيِّرُ مَا بِأَنفُسِهِمْ ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّ اللَّهَ لَمْ يَكُمْ غَيِّرًا نِعْمَةً أَنْعَمَهَا لَا قَوْمٍ حَتَّى يُغَيِّرُ مَا بِأَنفُسِهِمْ The Ummah used to live in that status, you know, status of prestige. You know, we are the greatest nation. We have everything. Everyone is scared of us. And we are the peacemakers. We bring peace to the earth. You know, it, they, they already say that. You know, you don't need to, 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 to be proud of it. It is a reality, you know. The one who brings peace to the hum, humankind is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam through the divine revelation given to him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But why is, it, why is it possible that nowadays we are scattered? When the Khilafah was there, you can see how powerful is the nation of Islam. When I say nation of Islam, I'm not talking about the nation of Islam in the U.S., those people who have Elijah Muhammad as their prophet. I'm talking about Islam as, as the Ummah. Okay? That one is not nation of Islam. They are nation of another, 
another religion. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide them. But how is it possible that we are the most powerful and nowadays you see the way the Muslims are? We're cut into so many pieces. We have to accept the reality. Now, nowadays it becomes countries. We accept that. Everyone is affiliated to the leader who happened to be in your own country. You have to obey. There are some people who might go against the knowledge and say that, no, 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 I have to look for the khilafah and all of these things. No, the, the, your, your, your leader is the leader of the place where you are living in. But my question is, why is this status removed from the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? To me, there is nothing to justify this behavior except our own attitude. If every single one of us is going to fix himself, fix your family, fix your a friend participate in the da'wah be isn't Allah ta'ala you will see the leadership is going to be a reflection of this and change is it possible to have a change yes change is not difficult but the difficult is to have the change within our own self read the history my brother and sister to see after Muawiyah radiallahu anhu what happened to the Muslim Ummah good or bad bad in terms of attitudes and manners and in terms of da'wah is bad after Muawiyah, when Nazir comes, you know what happened? Leaders, one after the other, they kept on coming, and you know who they were. People stopped accepting Islam, you know, and people oppressed many Muslims. Nobody is almost happy except those people who are the leaders and their own clients, you know. But subhanAllah, in the middle of this tragedy, this is what I want you to understand. In the middle of this tragedy, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helped the ummah to be led by who? By Sulaiman ibn Abdul Malik. Suleiman bin Abdul Malik, he's the, one of the least in terms of corruption if you compare with the predecessors. He fixed the prayer first, which has been messed up by the, community, by the previous leaders. You know, they don't corrupt just the dunya, even the religion also they corrupt it, you know. He fixed the prayer first, when he was about to die, he asked his personal assistants, what do you think I should do? Who should be the second, you know? Who should be the second person after me? He said, my son, he said, the one with us is very young. And the one who is not here is too far. We cannot rely upon him. And then he said, what do you think about Umar bin Abdul Aziz? He says, yes, this is the only one that left for you. He said, but I am afraid of the family members they will not accept because the norm is somebody who is very close to the Sultan will replace him. Umar is part of the royal family, but he is not within this lineage. But you know what that personal assistant told him? He says, sir, you have to understand that now you are almost going to leave this life to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You shouldn't be thinking of anybody else. You have to remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to question you about what you did and whom did you leave for the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. SubhanAllah, it walked with him. He did not look at the cultural practice of the Khilafah. He just said, no problem. He appointed Umar and then after Umar, Yazid should replace, should replace him. And you can see what happened. That corruption that has been placed on earth in the Muslim community has been cleansed by Umar bin Abdul Aziz by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in two years. SubhanAllah. It's just like a miracle, you know. Two years was more than enough for this man to clean the community and to bring the ummah back to the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, people are shocked because people will think that change cannot happen. The corruption is so bad. People cannot change. But Allah SWT brought it to the people to keep hujjah on them that change is always possible. But are you ready for it or not? Somebody asked Al-Hasan al-Basri. He said, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لا يأتي زمان إلا والذي بعده شر منه. Because they used to complain against Al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf. So when they talk to the companions, the companions used to tell them, be patient, be patient, be patient, which we don't have nowadays. Rasulullah knows that there is going to be corrupt leaders. They will take your money, they will beat you up, they will take you to jail, they will take your right. Rasulullah saw someone talk about them and it happened exactly and it kept on happening in many places on earth up to date. But what was the advice by Rasulullah? Some of them said, Ya Rasulullah, why can't we just pull out the sword and fight them back? Rasulullah said, no, you cannot do that. Ma aqamu fikum salah. As long as the prayer is established in you, it doesn't mean that he himself come and pray with you, no. As long as they let you practice your religion, the Prophet said, leave them with their own affairs and exercise patience because fighting will not bring good. And whoever lives in our own time can tell you 
Yes, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was right when he mentioned that that word. So Anas ibn Malik used to tell them, I hear Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam saying that la yati zamanun illa wal ladhi ba'dahu sharrun min. There will not be a time except that the time that will come after it is worse than it. But then they told him, how about Umar ibn Abdul Aziz? The time before it is corruption. You know, after Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the Khulafa al Rashidin and Muawiyah radiallahu anhu, and then corruption take place and it kept on getting bad, bad, bad until the time of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. And then he told them this is an exception and a lesson and a message from Allah SWT to all of us. He said, La budda lil nasi min zaman in yatanafasuna fi. There has to be a time where people, Allah SWT, will let them breathe, let them come back to their own consciousness. So, my brothers and sisters, before you talk about khilafa, khilafa, I really advise you to look at yourself first. Who are you to Allah SWT at the first place? Are you among those people when somebody tells you that, Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa you think you have your own personal interpretation? Or you are among those people who are waqafeen in the qawlillahi wa in the qawlil rasulihi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. To be honest with you, if you are not one of them, you shouldn't think of the khilafah because it might not come until the arrival of the Mahdi. Al-Imam Mahdi, the real one. Not the one that is hiding in the hall of a lizard, the real one. So if we want the change nowadays, we have to change ourselves. Change yourself first, be good. Participate in bringing good to the community. Participate in bringing good to your family. Participate in, in converting people into the truth and righteousness. And inshallah, Allah SWT will interfere and grant you that which you're looking for. May Allah SWT grant us good and grant us leadership and help our leaders to do that which is right and that which pleases Allah SWT in, in their leadership.